Welcome to the What If It's Not Depression podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Tina Stein, and I'm going to be interviewing Kate Vasquez. She is a functional medicine physician's assistant and founder of Radiant Health. She's an award, award-winning award author, and she loves empowering women to reclaim their health and vitality to become the confident leader and lover they aspire to be. She created an online course, The Estrogen Reset, and wrote a bestseller book called Estrogen is a B-I-T-C-H. It's right here (laughs) to bring awareness about estrogen dominance. And she teaches women how to naturally balance their hormones, particularly if they're estrogen dominant, use their cycle as their superpower and reconnect to themselves at their highest level. Welcome, Kate Vasquez. And uh, if you really enjoy this episode, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Welcome, Kate. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Tina. Thank you so much. I'm just honored and blessed to be here today with you. Yeah, yeah. I'm so I was so uh, pleased to meet you and get to know your story. And I would love it if you could share because estrogen dominance is something that most people don't really know what that is. I mean, they've heard of estrogen, what's estrogen dominance. I would love for you to talk about that. Uh, I know we're going to deep dive into that, but uh, talk about how you even got into that. You know, can you start with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Because I, I, my story is just, is what led me to, to writing the book, you know, Um, as a, as a physician assistant, I started my career about seven, eight years ago and as a cardiology PA. So I did that for a few months, but I realized it was, even though as much as I loved cardiology, it was just very specialized. So I jumped into urgent care and I loved it um, because it was seeing the quick fix, you know, helping people to feel better in the moment. But as time went on, um, I jumped into urgent or not urgent care, but ER too a little bit, but I realized that that just wasn't, wasn't for me. So I just focused on urgent care and over time, I started seeing the same patients over and over again, and they were coming in for like a lot of the same issues. And they would ask me like, why am I getting sick all the time? Why are the medications I'm taking not helping me? And, uh, I just didn't have the answers for them. I wanted to be able to tell them like, this is what's going on. But I was just like, I'm I'm, I'm not sure, you know? Um, but I knew there was more to, to what was going on with them more than just the picture, the overall picture. And then one day I was listening to Dr. Mark Hyman talk about functional medicine. And when he was explaining functional medicine is the medicine of why, and looking at all the different systems and how they're all integrated. I was like, wow, this all makes sense. It was like a light bulb went off and I was so excited to learn more because I realized this is how I want to practice medicine. You know, I don't want to keep prescribing medications to people and they're not getting better, you know, cause I'm sure like yourself and, and myself, like we all get into medicine to help people feel better. But we find that after a period of time, like we're not, we're not. It's just like, it's more of a a sick care model versus a healthcare model. It's just like managing, suppressing a lot of uh, symptoms and disorders, but instead of actually getting to the root of what's going on. So um, once I discovered functional medicine, I uh, learned where could I, or I I started looking, where can I find more? And I uh, dove into the Institute for Functional Medicine, got my certification And at the same time, I started my own practice because like once my eyes were open, I couldn't go back. And so I started my own practice. And at the same time too, I had my own health issues. I was struggling with migraines since childhood. And then, um, as a teenager, I developed acne, got on birth control, which it it did help control that. We can definitely talk about this a little bit later, but, um, it suppressed my hormones, which did clear up the acne, but that was a sign of hormonal imbalance right there. And then I also in my, uh, twenties started having a lot of issues with constipation and bloating, also anxiety from high school into college. Uh, I didn't, no one like taught me how to manage anxiety. And of course, just like just the stress of going through school and getting the grades and going to PA school and PA school was super, super hard too. It was just, it was, you know, a very stressful time in my life. And I had all these issues that were manifesting my body, but I didn't think that they were like, 
debilitating or, or, or chronic enough. However, I, I was put on specific medications like Prozac to help with the anxiety, right. which it did nothing. It did nothing to, to manage the, the stress and the anxiety, you know? Right. And right. so, so yeah. So once I discovered functional medicine, I started working on healing my body, healing my gut. And a lot of the symptoms did resolve. Like I learned to manage the anxiety, um, the, the bloating constipation resolved. I was able to reduce the frequency of the migraines. Um, and then about a couple, about two years ago, I realized it was finally time for me to come off birth control. And so I had done a lot of the work, you know, prepping my body, preparing my body. And when I finally stopped taking it after a um, a month or two, my cycles were really irregular. And I started having breast tenderness and, um, a lot of cramping. I also started getting a little weight in my butt, hips and thighs. And I'm like, Whoa, what is going on? <laughs> because I'm like, you know, this is not supposed to be happening. Right. I never had these issues before going on the birth control. Um, when I was in high school and I had been on them for over 15 years and coming off, uh, my body, my hormones went crazy. And so I ended up doing testing of my hormones and discovered I had had an imbalance of estrogen and ratio to progesterone. I had estrogen dominance where I really had to support the metabolism of my estrogen and support, um, progesterone levels again, cause it had been suppressed for so long. And that was what was causing those symptoms. And once I started balancing out my hormones, it took several months, but I finally was able to get back to where I was prior to being on the birth control. And then I started noticing a lot of similar patterns with my female clients as well. They were experiencing ERGs, you know, having these symptoms of estrogen dominance and by doing the testing, digging even deeper and helping to support their hormones naturally, uh, they were able to get re resolution in their symptoms. Right. So, so, yeah. So you, you, what you've noticed is that you had high levels of estrogen and, um, lower levels of progesterone when you came off of the birth control pills. Yeah. Correct. What, Correct. what was it about the birth control pills that caused that imbalance? Is there something about the birth control pills that's creating that? Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting because I really started digging into more research around birth control and how it's impacting and contributing to the hormonal balance because yeah, a lot of women, when they're coming off, it's their, their hormones go crazy. And sometimes whatever the issue is prior, um, which thankfully, um, the acne did not come back full blown because I'd done a lot of work on the gut and stuff, uh, prior to that. But a lot of women, like if they have severe menstrual cramping, you know, uh, PMS symptoms usually ends up getting worse. And so when I was digging into the research and literature, like, why is this, why are the hormones impacting our health first, um, horm uh, the birth control impacts our gut lining. So there's studies showing that there is a link between leaky gut and birth control, which makes wow. sense why I started having constipation and bloating in my twenties, because I was already on it for like four or five years by that point. And now I'm starting having gut issues. And so there is a definitely link there. And we know that, um, when it comes to the microbiome, mm -hmm. uh, we have what's called the estrobilum. So the estrobilum is all this bacteria that's responsible for the metabolization of estrogen because estrogen first gets metabolized in our liver. There's phase one, phase two. And then once it goes through phase two, it goes to phase three, which is our intestines. And so we have issues in the gut, um, a disruption of the microbiome, leaky gut, stuff like that. That's going to impact, uh, our ability to be able to get rid of estrogen. So, um, so yeah, from those studies alone, showing leaky gut with birth control. That's the first thing. Another thing too, is that, um, birth control also, disrupts or impacts the ability, uh, for the liver to make bilirubin and bilirubin is what's needed right. to produce bile to help bind inactive estrogen. So as it's going through the liver again, um, going from active form to inactive form, it's then binds to bile and goes to the intestines. So it can be excreted. So that was another way that it was contributing to this hormone imbalance. Cause if estrogen is not getting eliminated in the body, what happens is it gets reabsorbed back into circulation. And so that's where like, if women are taking this excess estrogen is just constantly being reabsorbed, it's not being eliminated out like it should be. And so those are the, the big main things that were, um, being, you know, contributing to, to these hormonal imbalances when women were coming off. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So you used a word that's probably not familiar to most people, estrogen, right? Yes. Can you spell yeah. that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's E-S-T-R-O-B-O-L-O-M-E. 
I believe that's how you spell that strobilome. Yeah, but it's basically estrogen microbiome combined together, the strobilome. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big word. Unusual like, word. So I just want to make sure people understand what that word was. <laughs> yeah. She said it so fast, you know, and I wanted to make sure we're like, what did she say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, I appreciate you helping us to break that down because, yeah, we're learning so much about the microbiome and not just um, in general, for, in terms of like general health. I mean, you have the gut brain access, but there's also the gut brain and hormone access because all these three systems, they're impacting each other. And, um, and so it's important, like, uh, as we're learning more about the bi- microbiome, just like the intricacies, intricacies of that, you know, you, you don't just have just the microbiome, but it's also contributing to the production of the neurotransmitters, pr- uh, contributing to metabolization of estrogen and helping us to get rid of it. Cause our bodies were supposed to use it and then get rid of it. But then there are things that are impacting the gut, which, per- which is preventing that from happening. Right. Right. So you mentioned how, um, the estrogen dominance caused some anxiety in you. Do you also notice that the estrogen dominance is connected to depression? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to, first off, I want to describe estrogen dominance for those who aren't aware, like what is estrogen dominance? Estrogen dominance is basically, (laughs) yeah, is an imbalance of estrogen and ratio to progesterone. And so, uh, when I say in ratio, what I typically do is testing to figure out what are the progesterone estrogen levels in the specific time of a woman's cycle. So when women are cycling, um, especially if they cycle pretty regularly, it definitely makes it easier to be able to do the testing. So, uh, for example, if a woman has a 28 day cycle, I am looking uh, at doing testing during the luteal phase when progesterone is peaking. And that's usually dates 19 to 22. So I'll typically pick day 21, um, to make it easy, which is seven days minus, um, 28 to look at the progesterone estrogen levels. So progesterone should be at a specific range, which optimal range is 15 to 25. And then I look at estrogen to see where it's at. Now there's not really an optimal range for estrogen, but if I see estrogen like 200, 300, that's a lot of estrogen during that time of the cycle. So what I typically like to see is like estrogen around 150, around hundred towards the lower range of, of estrogen. Um, because yeah, it it will create this estrogen dominance effect. And what I've noticed is that there are three different types of patterns of estrogen dominance. And, uh, the first pattern is normal levels. So like I mentioned, if, if, if a woman has, uh, normal levels of progesterone, so it's between 15 to 25, but her estrogen is really high, like 200, 300. That's the first pattern. Mm-hmm. The second pattern I'll typically see is low progesterone levels with normal estrogen. So for example, her progesterone might be eight or 10 and estrogens hanging out around hundred. So that's the second pattern. The third pattern is low progesterone and high estrogen. So progesterone is like eight or 10 and her estrogens are like two, 300. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, with that, you know, knowing that, uh, that helps me determine like how I need to support the hormones moving forward, but we can get into that later. But, uh, but yes, as yeah, go ahead. Quick question. So I just want the audience to understand what kind of, uh, testing is this blood work that you're talking about or urine? Yeah. So I typically start with blood work just to kind of get a baseline, um, which is awesome. Cause if you, if you are seeing a practitioner and you know, you have, are using insurance, you can definitely get, get it done, uh, via blood work, the progesterone. And I like to check two estrogens, estradiol and estrone, mm-hmm. uh, because those are important. A lot of times only estradiol gets checked, but estrone is a better marker too, to see if there's a lot of estrogen present in the body. And so not checking that can actually, you can miss out on a lot of information there, but I like to also do urine testing too, because blood work is limited. And what I like to see is, the metabolites of progesterone, of estrogen, of testosterone, uh, cortisol, and other, other markers too, because especially with the estrogen metabolites, um, because estrogen may look pretty good serum blood wise, but when we're looking at the metabolites, it's actually not really getting metabolized out properly like it should. And that can contribute to estrogen dominance as well. So that is a great question. So when you were talking about the three patterns, you were talking specifically about the blood or serum. 
Well, it's, it's both. Yeah. You can, you can, uh, as far as the markers 15 to 25, yes, that's definitely, uh, specific towards the, the blood testing, right. but you can still look at those specific patterns from urine testing as well. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. So the urine looks at metabolites and how it's, how the estrogen is processed. Uh, and it, it's processed differently depending on the metabolite, which you can talk about if you'd like. Um, but yeah, I was just wanted to be clear about those specific patterns looking at, uh, so do you, do you total up the estradiol and estrone, or do you look just at the estradiol when you look at those patterns? So when I look, that's a great question. When I look at those patterns, I, I primarily look at estradiol, but I do like to like look at estrone too, because what I typically like to see is more estradiol than estrone. Because mm -hmm. if there's more estrone in the system, that's what's producing those metabolites. And that's another reason why, because you know, yeah, if estrone is higher, let's do the urine test. Let's see what your metabolites look like, because that's checking phase one and phase two of estrogen metabolism through the liver. Mm -hmm. And so, so then, yeah, if I'm seeing higher estrone, let's look at these metabolites and see where we need to support because uh, a lot of people can Google estrogen dominance and they'll all say, Oh, take dim, take this, take that. But not everyone should be taking dim. And actually some women that take dim actually may feel worse. And that's because they probably didn't need dim uh, because it's supporting phase one metabolism. And maybe they didn't need to support phase one metabolism through the liver. That's why the urine testing is so important. Cause I'd rather, I'd rather test and then determine the treatment than just treat blindly. And, uh, and phase two, you know, is, is supported with like B vitamins and, and, uh, I like broccoli sprouts, um, magnesium, you know, all those, uh, specific minerals and nutrients to really help support phase two. And so before creating a, a protocol to balance the hormones, I like to do the testing and see, okay, do we need support phase one? Do we need to support phase two, or do we have to support both? Right. Right. And I think it's important for people to know that you really need to do both, uh, as opposed to just phase one, because phase one can cause a lot of free radical damage. If there isn't a phase two working properly, clearly, I mean, if you know that phase two is working properly and you're already supporting that, then you could add phase one, but you don't want to do phase one without phase two. That's why people feel worse because of the liver sort of creating all this free radical damage. Uh, and, and it's not being taken up and converted right away in the phase two. So, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Can you talk more about the urinary metabolites? Um, there's two, four and 16. Let, let's, yes. let's the audience know more <laughs> about those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool, nerdy stuff guys. But I mean, uh, since we're diving in and talking about the urine test, yeah, there are. So when estrone gets metabolized out, you have the three metabolites. 2-hydroxyestrone is the first one. And this is the really good metabolite that you want to see. You want to see higher levels of this one. Um, and this is where DIM is going to support if that's needed. So if I'm seeing lower levels of 2-hydroxy, I'll recommend DIM. But 2-hydroxy really protects the DNA. And actually it's really protective and preventative for, for cancers such as breast cancer or other estrogen related cancers. So that's why we want to see high levels of 2-hydroxyestrone. The other two metabolites is 16-alpha-hydroxyestrone, which I want to see like low to no <laughs> levels of, of this metabolite. And this one, I typically will see higher amounts when there's issues in the gut or if there's thyroid issues or if someone's overweight, obese. Um, but typically most of the time it's, it's usually issues in the gut. Um, and so there are supplements too, that can support that. But first and foremost, what I like to recommend is looking into the gut. Let's see what's going on. Do we have to rebalance the microbiome? Do we have to, you know, support digestion and all these different things to really help heal the gut. Um, but sometimes I'll also add in something called calcium deglucrate. And that is because when we go back to the microbiome, the estrobilome, uh, there's this enzyme called beta glucuronidase, which right. is normally supposed to be in low, low levels. But when there's that disruption of the microbiome, there's a lot of bad bacteria or yeast or parasites that are taking over this enzyme will increase. And the importance of this enzyme is when it's low, it allows the inactive bacteria coming from phase two bound to bile to be eliminated through the gut. Right. But if there's high levels of this beta glucuronidase, this enzyme is actually turning estrogen back into its active form. And now the body is like, Oh, Oh, you're, you're ready to go again. Let's bring you back into circulation and use you again. And it's like, no, that's what we don't want to happen, yeah. but the body doesn't know any better. And the enzyme is 
you know, converting it back to the active form. And so and that, calcium, that raises, that raises the estrogen levels again. Exactly. And that's contributing yeah, to those higher levels uh, of estrogen in the body. So the calcium deglucrate does not lower the enzyme, but it does help facilitate the elimination of estrogen through phase three, which is the intestines. Mm -hmm. And then you have uh, the, the third metabolite for hydroxyestrone, which if it's in high, high amounts can actually damage DNA. So it's the opposite of the two where it damages DNA and actually can increase the rest, the risk of breast cancer or estrogen related cancers. And so we want to also see that in low to no levels as well. Right. And, uh, what really helps to support lower levels of this four hydroxy is B vitamins. Um, so B12, uh, folate, which is really, really important to keep these levels low because yeah, the, the, um, the four hydroxy can then produce these, <laughs> these, um, these compounds, you know, that are free radicals that, that damage the DNA. Right. Right. So you want to have high, uh, uh hydroxy, yes. uh, high two hydroxy, sorry. Yep. And low four and 16. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we, we do a Dutch test, uh, uh yeah. through, um, Precisions Analytics, I think is the name of the company, yes. right? the Dutch test, it's a urine test. And it's extremely helpful in terms yeah. of looking at estrogen and progesterone and those three metabolites, uh, as well as testosterone, uh, yes. which is just as important in women as well as men. So, yeah. yeah. So the, yeah, that, that was an excellent explanation <laughs> of the urinary <laughs> metabolites. Um, and so, um, so I know, you know, I know that uh, there's several things that can cause your estrogen to get imbalanced. And unfortunately, sometimes people have this estrogen imbalance even before they have their periods and they start getting symptoms of PMS early on. And I've, I'm always surprised to learn how much people think that it's normal to have PMS, that that's just part of normal life. And I wanna say over and over and over again, PMS is not normal. And so can you talk a little bit about how it even gets imbalanced? What are the factors that cause estrogen to become imbalanced? Oh yeah. There, there's so many factors. I mean, first starting off with like the poor gut health. So the food that we eat, um, growing up, I used to eat, um, I thought it was pretty healthy, but and bless my mom. She, she definitely cooked for us most of the time, but once or twice a week when we were playing sports or involved in extracurricular activities, you know, we would eat at like McDonald's or pizza hut or, you know, whatever fast food. Um, so to give her a break from cooking, but even when she would cook, um, she would cook things from packaged foods, you know? And I'm like, I think back, I'm like, I used to have eat a taco salad with Doritos chips. And I'm like, I cringe at the thought of that now. Cause I'm like, Doritos chips are just so processed, yeah. but my, my mom, my parents, they didn't know any better. Right. No one taught them about nutrition and how all the ingredients in a food, a packaged food was very inflammatory. So yeah, consuming a lot of processed foods, a lot of food that contain pesticides, mm -hmm. um, which yeah, back in the day, we didn't have as many like organic, unless you shopped at a local farmer's market, you know, we didn't really have a lot of organic foods. Everything was sprayed with pesticides. Um, right. also the meat, meat and dairy, just full of antibiotic and hormones, you know, and I grew up in a rural country town. So I'm like, I'm sure that's probably what contributed to the acne, you know, consuming all this meat and dairy full of hormones, which contributed to the hormonal imbalance and the gut issues later on. Um, so yeah, so thinking of those foods, like things that are impacting the gut, um, also stress, stress is another big factor that is going to contribute to um, imbalance in these hormones because stress is also impacting the gut, but also when it comes to, uh, production of our sex hormones, cortisol and progesterone and our sex hormones all start with cholesterol. Right. And so when our bodies are under stress, it's not focused on producing our sex hormones, which is needed for reproduction It is more focused on producing more cortisol. And so what I'll typically see when I do the testing, when women have lower progesterone levels, I'm looking at their adrenals and seeing what's going on there. And usually there's some kind of adrenal dysfunction, whether it's high cortisol or low cortisol. And I know this is what we need to focus on and address because, um, progesterone, uh, when it's lower levels, 
you know, remember it's creating two, it's like two and three pattern, two and three of estrogen dominance. It creates that estrogen dominance effect and it's contributing to those PMS symptoms because progesterone is our feel good hormone. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel happy. It's nature's natural value. It also helps us sleep at night. And so when our bodies are under stress, you know, as I mentioned, like where it's, it's not focused on reproduction. It's focused on that fight or flight. Let's produce a lot of cortisol. Um, so this is another reason why, um, you know, estrogen dominance, especially when there's those lower progesterone levels, um, is, is contributing to depression when women have, you know, uh, depression, especially those PMS symptoms right before their period. Um, that's one of those ways that it contributes to that. So, um, stress toxins, toxins in our environment, not just the pesticides in our food, but also, uh, the things that we use on a daily basis. And, um, I remember learning about environmental working group and looking at a statistic one time, they're saying, you know, doing a study on the amount of chemicals a woman used. And they say a woman uses on average 12 products a day and leaves the house with 168 chemicals on her body. And it just like blew my mind. I was like, that sounds like a lot. And (laughs) it actually kind of freaked me out. Cause then I started grabbing all the products I was using my shampoo and body washes and lotion and makeup. I'm like reading all the ingredients. And I'm like, what are these things? That, and, know. You know, what are these ingredients? You can't even pronounce them. And I'm like, what are they in here for? And I'm like, I'm putting this on my body. And right. so, um, I started swapping them out one at a time. Cause you know, at first it was overwhelming. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm going to just have to get rid of everything in my house, which, uh, is not always, it's not always region- reasonable yeah, at the it's time. Not practical. But it's not practical. Exactly. Sure. But slowly starting to swap them out. So I slowly started swapping out all my shampoos and soaps and um, makeup, I was using the laundry detergent, even household cleaning supplies, you know, people using Clorox and Lysol. I'm like, right. yes, it kills bacteria, but it's so toxic to our bodies. And so these toxins contain chemicals called xenoestrogens, which are molecules and, and chemicals that uh, mimic estrogen. They look very similar to estrogen. And when they, our bodies are exposed to them, it actually attaches to estrogen receptors in our body. So now our body thinks there's even more estrogen than there really is. And that can contribute to estrogen dominance as well. Um, so really taking a look at what we're using, um, and I, in our home, you know, as household cleaning products on our body, but also nonstick cookware too. That's another big thing. You know, what are you cooking with? Does it have a nonstick, um, uh, a surface? So it's better to swap to, yeah. um, uh, using pots and pans that are, throw yeah, throw those that. out. You, <laughs> yep. Yep. Use like stainless steel or, um, ceramic. ceramic. Yeah. I love, I have a wonderful set of ceramic pots and pans glass, you could do, but it's harder to cook on or, or even cast iron too is really cast good. Iron. So yeah. Yeah. And then also food storage containers. So we had a ton of plastic food storage containers. So just throwing those out and switching over one by one to glass, um, storage containers and water bottles too. You know, um, I'm like, I can't believe how many plastic water bottles are out there, but oh, yeah, it's better. <laughs> it's so better to have your own filtered water at home, get a glass or stainless steel bottle right. and just There's fill that up every right day. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the best way and best way to go. Um, so yeah, those toxins are going to definitely, um, play a role in, in estrogen and balance as well. Also medications too, like birth control, um, can contribute to that. Uh, breast implants too, is another big one um, right. that, that a lot of women one. aren't yeah, a lot of women aren't aware of, but, um, but yeah, the, the breast implants themselves, uh, you know, whether you have a saline or silicone, that's the filling, but both of them have a silicone outer casing and the silicone does contain a lot of chemicals. It also contains a lot of heavy metals as right. well. And women don't realize like when they're putting them in their bodies, um, essentially they are a foreign body. And so the body over time is going to attack it and it creates this outer capsule to protect it because, you know, the, the chemicals are being leaked through silicone is very porous. And so things are going to be passing through it. And so now the body's going to build this capsule around it to protect you from it, but it can only do so much, you know? Right. And so women are exposed to these toxins and chemicals um, that yes. can con- contribute to estrogen dominance. And another thing is histamines too. That's another big um, thing that can contribute to uh, estrogen uh, connect, dominance. Connect because, the dots. First, let's back yes. up a little bit. I do want to mention <laughs> to the audience about the, the silicone uh, breast implants that 
one, they can leak. Yes. <laughs> and two, they can get moldy. <laughs> yes. So molds. big time. And so lots of women do have to have them removed. And I tell you, they feel so much better when that happens. And oh, nice. uh, so, yeah, so going to histamines, connect the dots. How is yeah. estrogen connected <laughs> to histamine? Yes. So histamine and estrogen attached to H1 receptor receptors, histamine one receptors. And so when, uh, women have high, high levels of histamine, um, there are specific population of people that have genetic mutations of specific gene where when they have, when they're exposed to certain like foods or allergens, they have a lot of histamine built up and made in their body and they can't break it down. And so this contributes to something called histamine intolerance, which is not an allergic reaction. It's actually more of like a delayed reaction to this increased histamine level in the body. Um, but it can cause a lot of similar symptoms as having allergies. Like it can cause rashes and congestion and, you know, sinus issues, stuff like that. But it also can result in gut issues and contribute to anxiety. Um, it can contribute to so many other like weird, crazy symptoms that, you know, you go to the doctor and then, and the doctor's like blood work, you look fine, but it like, it could be histamine. And I really, I, I recognize that when I was working with a lot of my clients, like most of them were getting better with all the different things that I was working on, you know, gut and stress and nutrients and, you know, supporting their hormones. But then there was a specific population that was still wasn't getting better. I'm like, I'm doing everything, you know, the same thing with them, but they're just not getting better. And then I realized the missing piece was histamine. Mm. And that's because when there's as excess histamine, um, it actually causes more estrogen to be released and also more estrogen in the body causes more histamine to be released. Uh, and they're so also attaching to, cycle. yeah, it becomes this vicious cycle and they're attaching the same receptor, you know? So, so it's right. just creating more, more issues in the body. And it was so crazy. Once I discovered that this was the missing piece and that, you know, select population removing histamine foods, mm -hmm. um, it was like night and day difference because mm -hmm. it was contributing to pain during ovulation, the menstrual cramps, the PMS. And once I removed that, it was like, they were night and day. It's so, so much better. So yeah, histamine is another thing that. <laughs> yeah. And I've noticed that when women take bioidentical hormones, they, mm -hmm. it seems like an allergic reaction, but if they already have a foundation of histaminergic reactions, yeah. like uh, not having enough of that enzyme that you mentioned, the DAO, uh, diamine oxidase, you need diamine oxidase. And if you don't make enough of that, either for genetic reasons, but also gut reasons, your gut is, if you have a gut dysbiosis, that could prevent you from making that enzyme, which then breaks down histamines. So although the initial, you know, uh, thing to do is to remove histaminergic foods. Ultimately you want to get to the bottom of it so that you can put those foods back in. And, and one of those things that could be causing this problem is also candida or yeast infection. So it's really looking at the gut when you have those kinds of issues, because their histamines are highly connected to yeast and mold. So yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if <laughs> it's like on top of that, not just the foods, but yeah, if you have a gut issue, candida, but also SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, right. that was another one that flares up histamines mold too. Um, and also women that have Lyme, so chronic infections. So all these can, um, cause what is the term is mast cell activation syndrome, which is another histamine issue too. Right, right. That just takes it to another level. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about how, how can you rebalance these estrogens, the different kinds of estrogens? What do you do in those different situations that you mentioned? Yeah, I, I first start with um, optimizing gut health and looking at the foods that they're eating. First off, getting rid of those processed foods, having them focus more on those organic foods, cleaner sources of protein. Um, also increasing fiber, lots and lots of fiber because mm -hmm. you want to support healthy bowel movement. You want to be going to the bathroom every single day. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because like I learned in PA school, I don't know about you, but um, it's like, oh, whatever's normal for the person. If a person's going, you know, normal, like yeah. every three days, that's normal. I'm like, nope. Uh, yeah, which we learn like that is not normal. You need to be going at least once a day, one to two times a day, three, maybe, but, but yeah, no more than that. 
If you're going more than that, that's a problem. And if you're not going daily, that's a problem as well. So yeah, you want to support a normal, healthy bowel movement every single day, really increase the fiber. Um, also I have them increase a lot of fats too, because we need healthy fats like omega threes so from fish, from nuts and seeds, just to really help support those progesterone levels. Um, I also like to look into vitamin C because vitamin C, B vitamins like B6 is really important to support progesterone. So it's like if progesterone is really low, um, supporting those nutrients as well, um, supporting the uh, metabolism of estrogen with like magnesium and focusing on those magnesium rich foods. Right. Um, I also will do, add in fermented foods, but I'm careful because if I suspect SIBO um, or histamine issues, or you candida. definitely want to avoid <laughs> or candida. Yeah. You want to avoid those histamine foods for now, right. Right. Um, even though they're good for your gut. Um, let's work on the gut stuff first. Then we can bring them back later once you feel, feel better. But yeah, that's, that's a, a, a common mistake. A lot of people will do. It's like, Oh yeah, let's just start eating a lot of kimchi and sauerkraut. And then they feel worse. First, but that's because there's a lot of stuff going on in the gut you got to address first. But um, right. that is the first thing. Another um, way I like to help rebalance estrogen, which is what I did coming off birth control, was something called C cycling, which is super, super simple that anyone can start doing now, mm -hmm. where you basically grind specific seeds um, mm -hmm. during specific times of the cycle. Mm -hmm. So, for example, during the first there's two phases of the menstrual cycle. The first phase, follicular phase, second phase is luteal phase. So to do the seed cycling for the first phase, follicular phase, uh, grinding one tablespoon of pumpkin and one tablespoon of flax every day, you want to grind them fresh daily to get all the nutrients from them and, uh, do that for the first 14 days. So if a woman has a regular 28 day cycle, it's for the first 14 days. Then when you switch over to the luteal phase, you switch the seeds to one tablespoon of, uh, sesame and one tablespoon of, um, sunflower seeds. And mm -hmm. that's going to support the, the luteal phase. So days 15 through 28. Now, if a woman has a 30 day cycle, she could, you know, do 15 and 15 but you don't want to do it any longer than that. And you want to keep alternating the seeds every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And that the reason behind the seed cycling is that the flax and pumpkin during the first half, uh, or it's, yeah, the first half of the cycle really helps support the production and uh, production and metabolization of estrogen. Mm -hmm. And then the sunflower and sesame uh, supports the production of progesterone during the second phase. Cause that's when progesterone is peaking during that second phase. Right. And so I did that. I did that the first um, three, four months of doing the seed cycling, alternating every two weeks, um, basically every 14 days. And uh, that really helped to regulate and support my hormones. And it was just like, it's so crazy, like how something so simple food really helps support my hormones. Um, so I really like to have a lot of my clients do that as well. Yes. And if a woman doesn't have a regular period every month, um, cause you want to start day one of the seed cycling on day one of your period, I have them start with the next new moon and then just continue to do that. And over time they start seeing their cycles shorten and become regular, which is so cool. Oh, wow. Um, that's really great. Yeah. Is. Yep. Food is medicine for sure. It really is. And then the next thing I have them do is start looking at all the toxins in their home and eliminating that. And there's a couple of uh, sources that I recommend they, they go to and check out like the environmental working group, which is what I mentioned. Um, you can look up all your products and they'll give you a rating, let you know how clean or dirty something is. Also think dirty app is an awesome app that I highly, highly recommend because there's a scanner on it right. and you can scan the products you have and you're using in your home to see how clean they are. And then you take it with you to the store, you, you always have your phone and you scan the products to find better products to swap out for. Um, so I love the think dirty app. There's another app too, called Yuka Y U K A, which you can also use has a scanner for all the products that you're using, but also for the food to check out the food in the stores and how clean they are. Oh, <laughs> so wow. yeah, That's yeah. Fantastic. I highly recommend using, yeah. If anything, download those two apps, think dirty and Yuka Y U K A. Um, so, and start did, checking out, did you say Y U K A Y U K A U K. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And it has a carrot, <laughs> okay. has a carrot yeah. as I an love, icon. I love the think dirty app. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that one. I'd never heard of oh, the helpful. UK. You got yeah, it. yeah. it's good to learn new things and especially oh, yeah. with apps that make your life easier. Oh my gosh. So particularly much. shopping. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cause you know, you'll get to the store um, and you know, something may look like it's, it's pretty good, non-toxic, but when you scan, you'll discover like, Oh, it, it uses like 
perfume, which you want to run away from anything that says perfume or fragrance, because you don't know what they're using for fragrance. And so um, I'm if like it's synthetic, if it's synthetic, it's absolutely a problem. So, right. and it doesn't say whether it's natural or synthetic. And even if it says natural, yeah. you're not really even still sure that it's natural because, um, you know, the powers to be have allowed companies to use the word natural and not mm-hmm. actually mean natural. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah. So, so if a company is actually disclosing, like, this is what we're using for the scent, you know, I'd rather stand behind and buy a product that actually lists out all the essential oils that they're using for the fragrance. And then if it just says fragrance or natural fragrance, yeah. Right. Cause like you said, you, you don't know. Um, but yeah. Um, so eliminating the toxins and and then the next thing is it's creating a self-care practice too, cause that's going to be huge and important, especially when it comes to, to managing stress. And that's something I learned as well, you know, instead of being prescribed a medication, and not learning how to manage it, I started diving into my own self-care practice where um, every day I I do meditation, um, uh, three times a week I do yoga, Um, sometimes during the day I'll do some deep breathing, especially if I feel um, some tension coming on. So those are just wonderful practices that someone can start incorporating. Another um, uh, form of self-care is also journaling. Journaling, um, my favorite thing is to write out like five to 10 things I'm grateful for and why, because a lot of times people will just say what they're grateful for, but you have to add in the why, that's because that just makes point. it even, even deeper. Yeah. That's a great, great, great point. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of the things that you do in your, with your patients, I do with my patients as well. The seed cycling is something that I don't necessarily do and that, because it's very specific to, uh, you know, cycles, obviously, and what you're doing in terms of stabilizing and balancing estrogen and progesterone. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of functional medicine is that a lot of the things that we do, like what you do helps people with their mood and what I do helps people with their estrogen dominance and progesterone, right? Right. But it's really the foundation of functional medicine is looking at foods, chronic infections, toxins, stress, and all of which affect your hormones, your particularly your stress hormones, which then kind of imbalance your sex hormones. And so it really comes down to those five pillars over and over and over again. Yeah. So yeah, this is really exciting. I love everything that you're talking about. So you talk about women using their cycle as a superpower. So what do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I love because I, I realize um, women actually, we, we are very powerful beings. And, uh, if we can really tune into our hormones, we can recognize that our, our hormones are always fluctuating throughout the cycle. And if we can tune into that, we can actually use it as our superpower. So for example, during the menstrual phase, our hormones are going to be at their lowest. Our energy is going to be at our lowest. And if we can recognize that that's probably the best time to incorporate more self-care, slow down a little bit, um, tune inward, uh, because that's going to set us up for the rest of the month, especially if we are, because I work with a lot of high performance achievers, and this is like really, really important for them because they're usually like, go, 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 go. And I usually, I'm like, I tell them like, I'm not making you stop working, but just like slow down a little bit. And during this time, what I usually uh, tell them is like, we have a superpower, it's called intuition. And so if we can slow down a little bit, tune in, we can use our intuition um, because especially if you are creating things for your business, or even if you're a, a, a stay at home mom and you're helping your kids with your project. I mean, this is even powerful for that too. Um, and any, wherever you are in your life, you know, by slowing down, you can uh, really listen and tune into your intuition. So you want to take this time for more self-care and don't do those tasks that are high energy that require a lot of brain power, because that's actually when you're just go, go, go during your period, that's also going to cause um, you to burn out for the rest of the month and not help you to like show up and do the things that you need to do. So I usually recommend women um, in the menstrual phase just to kind of slow down um, if, and, you know, go for a massage, incorporate, you know, take a bath, Epsom salt bath, incorporate some more of that self-care. And then as they move from the menstrual phase into their late follicular phase, um, they start to 
their energy starts to increase a little bit. So they'll start to gain a little bit more momentum. And that's when they want to start um, tackling like things on their to-do list, but not like really go at it full out, but just like starting to incorporate those things. Um, If they want to experiment or try new things, this will be like the best time for them to do that. Mm -hmm. And then um, as they move into their ovulation, they're going to feel their energy like peak. And, you know, I don't know about you, but it's like, when I am in that time of the phase, like I feel like I'm on top of the world because my energy is the highest. That's because estrogen and testosterone are peaking. And so um, this is going to be the best time for women to execute. So if they've been working on projects and things that they're planning, this is going to be the best time to execute. But two, also like if you're scheduling meetings or, you know, um, you're going to speak at an event, or if you're going to apply for an interview or go on a date, this is going to be the best time to do that (laughs) because you're going to be feeling your best and on top of the world and most self-confident. Um, and your superpower during this time is called mastery. So, um, just thinking of anything that you want to create, definitely create and execute it now. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then after ovulation, the energy starts to decline because now the hormones are starting to decline. Um, and so the insight uh, or superpower is called insight during this time, because that's a time of reflection. So kind of reflecting back over the month and just seeing like, you know, were there some things that could have could have been better or things that worked out, you know, things you want to continue forward, things you want to change moving forward. Um, the best time to like finish those projects and things that you're working on, this is the best time to clean the house. So, you know, if you, um, have been neglecting those dishes or, (laughs) you know, or (laughs) stuff in the closet. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or yeah. (laughs) Organizing things, you know, in the closet or whatever. Um, you definitely want to, to, uh, start doing that during this time of, of the phase. Um, so, so yeah, if, if women can really tune in, especially, you know, it's, it's easier to tune in with their hormones. They can use their, their, their menstrual cycle as a superpower, um, to show up in different phases, um, when they, when they are more in tune with their energy. But when a lot of women have a lot of hormonal imbalances, sometimes they're out of, um, touch with that. So that's why it's important. Like if you have issues with your, your hormones, you definitely want to get that addressed. But once you do, it's like, wow, now you're really in tune with your body and your energy and you can really use that to your advantage. Right. Right. And I think it's important for people uh, to understand, particularly women, that you're not wasting time when you are caring for yourself. You're, you're recharging your batteries, you're filling up your gas tank. And it's important to really do that on a regular basis and not feel guilty about it, not feel ashamed about it or weak about it. Um, and that you're not wasting time. And I think it's so important to hit home again and again and again about that, to wipe that off the slate. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of women are stuck there and they mm-hmm. run themselves into the ground and they get burned out mm-hmm. and you're wondering why. Okay, so right. it's like you have to plug your phone into the, you know, your charger. You have to plug yourself as well into your own charger or ways of recharging yourself. So yeah, great stuff. I'm so excited about this. So why don't we end, um, can you give three steps um, to start balancing estrogen right now? What can people do? Yeah, the three steps, I definitely recommend start that seed cycling. Because that is so simple to do. Um, you can buy them fresh um, at the store or check out a company I love and recommend. It's called Bia, B E E. YA wellness. They actually have all the seeds for phase one and fa- phase two already prepared for you. So all you have to do is just scoop it into your protein um, shake, your, uh, your salad, your oatmeal, you know, whatever it is that you can just scoop it and eat it or just eat them on their own. So definitely start doing that. Um, and then to uh, really increasing um, the, the fiber, the healthy fats. Oh, another thing I, I didn't mention is also cruciferous vegetables. I'm like, how can I forget? That's like so important yeah, that's like <laughs> for estrogen metabolism. Yeah. So those, it is yeah. top of the list. Those cruciferous vegetables are really going to help support phase phase one. And I know some people have issues with thyroid and they, they are worried about these cruciferous vegetables, but at the end of the day, if you lightly steam them, it's actually not going to impact your, your thyroid. You're actually 
I'm going to break down those properties, those glucosinolates, that's going to impact the thyroid. And you're actually going to be converting it into something called sulforaphane, which is actually really, really a potent antioxidant um, to support phase, phase two as well. So it's like, you're getting those cruciferous vegetables to support. Um, uh, it actually has dim in it, those cruciferous vegetables uh, for phase one, and then the sulforaphane um, for phase two. So increasing your cruciferous vegetables, increasing your fiber, increasing those healthy fats, uh, making sure that you're going regular and then, um, and then, uh, so I would actually pair seed cycling with the food. So we'll, we'll, we'll say step one is food, seed cycling and all those, um, increasing the fiber fats and cruciferous vegetables Two, eliminating those toxins. And then three, creating that self-care routine. Great. Great. <laughs> wow. This was so packed with so many great ideas and uh, you know you really we really dove in pretty deeply with when it comes to estrogen dominance and took it apart completely I would imagine I don't think there was anything that you didn't talk about <laughs> oh there, there's so much more that's why you just have to get the book and, and read it because there, there's just so much more <laughs> right right yeah so get get Kate Vasquez's book um uh, I'm assuming it's on Amazon Right. Yeah. Okay. So estrogen is a bitch, a B I T C H. <laughs> okay. Great title. I love the title. <laughs> Thank it you. Is. It's a bitch. Sure. It is. It is a bitch when it's imbalanced, right. but what I want women to recognize is that we do need estrogen. It is important for us. So, uh, if it's imbalanced, let's get it back into balance. So it's working for us and it becomes right. our best friend. Right. Bitch when it's dominant, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're exactly. going to put her back in her place. <laughs> All yeah. right, Kate, it was great, really great having you on my show. I, and I'm sure everyone's going to be so happy to hear everything that you had to offer. I really appreciate you being here and thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Eugenia. You're welcome.